It's not going to happen. Um, studies at MIT in 2003 and 2009 and Harvard in 2003 are ones that I could refer you to, but there have been others. Dry cask storage is a much cheaper proposition. Reprocessing, as Frank mentioned, does not eliminate the need for additional storage facilities. So if the reason you want to pursue reprocessing is so you don't have to build a storage facility, this won't solve your problem. Um, and then I would note, in terms of the space, on its face, the argument that we're a small country with lots of people and it's hard to site a storage facility seems reasonable. But the amount of space we're talking about isn't that great. Dry casks containing 100,000 tons of spent fuel would cover about 25 acres. If you said to yourself, well, I want more space so I could get in between them and have access to them, etc., they might cover 50 acres. The White House complex and the ellipse is about 52 acres. So even a country the size of South Korea should be able to figure out a place to put this material. Um, the not in my backyard argument. Um, Frank has articulated a version of it that would have to do with the jobs. Um, and I'll acknowledge that there are jobs associated with um, a reprocessing plant, but there are also jobs associated with storage. And the experience of the United States with WIP is that it may be one of the most popular nuclear facilities in the United States in terms of the reception by the local populace. It's worked pretty well um, and is supported by, by the local population. I would just ask you, which would you rather have uh, near your house? A uh, hundred ton inert steel and concrete containers like the ones that were pictured earlier that basically aren't going anywhere even in the event of a tsunami. Or a first of a kind plant processing highly radioactive spent fuel under pressure using molten salt and operating at greater than 500 degrees centigrade. To me, the choice is pretty clear. And so I'm, I must admit, while the not in my backyard problem is a, is a significant one, and I acknowledge that, it isn't at all clear to me that a reprocessing plant does a lot to solve it. The next argument is energy independence. Um, so if a country is uh, reliant on foreign sources of oil, it doesn't want to increase its dependence uh, by being even more reliant on uh, foreign sources of nuclear fuel. I know that the United States uh, gets about 50% of its fuel for power reactors from just one country, Russia. But leaving that aside, uh, uranium supplies are abundant and growing. It's as common as tin. Um, known recoverable resources um, are at an 80-year supply at this point. And when we look for it, we find more. Recoverable supplies of uranium are about three times what they were in 1975. And there's no particular reason why we should believe that, that we can't continue to find more. Moreover, uranium suppliers are geographically and politically diverse. You can see the larger um, countries, and that's by, based on resources. They're somewhat different in terms of how fast they're pulling the stuff out of the ground. It's largely the same characters, but the order changes. Um, but you can see that Australia, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, Canada, Niger, South Africa are big players in this. So it's a diverse set of countries, and it includes uh, large, stable, market-oriented democracies um, that are friendly to both Japan and South Korea. And I would note in conclusion that no power reactor has ever been shut for lack of fuel. Lack of fuel has not been a problem for power reactors. In terms of technology development, um, I'm not sure how compelling or even how strong this argument is even in the minds of those who make it, but it probably needs to be dealt with. Uh, fast neutron reactors are not now economically competitive with light water reactors. The costs of novel technologies tend to rise rather than fall. The experience of the Department of Energy, sadly, has been in most cases that projects end up costing more than initially anticipated. 
often much more. Certainly the Japanese experience of Akasha falls <coughs> in that category. But most importantly, what I would say, is that dry cast storage does not foreclose future options. It's amazing to me to think, and it, it strikes me almost as technological arrogance, that we would say that we know now better than what people will know in 100 years uh, what to do with this fuel. And that we can more adequate, we can handle it better than they can. Um, it seems to me that if you want to preserve the best option, you probably ought to store it for a while. Uh, competitive advantage versus other states. Fuel cycle services may well be important in terms of marketing reactor, power reactor. Um, but the basic economic argument still obtained. If dry cask storage is the cheapest option, why would a foreign customer opt to reprocess? And is it credible that South Korea or Japan would, would actually subsidize the fuel uh, management, spent fuel management of another country by reprocessing for something other than its costs? Seems unlikely to me. So if I were a customer of, a uh, potential customer of South Korea in, in marketing of power reactors, I would choose the, the rational option to store the fuel. And I would note that the Japanese experience with reprocessing has not been successful on a financial basis. Um, they've invested greater than $20 billion in costs in a plant that's not yet fully operational. It's many times its initial estimate. Frank gave you a lifetime operating cost of $100 billion. Um, if it reaches that, um, I would argue that it's been, will have been a financial disaster. So in conclusion, um, relative to dry cast storage, none of the arguments in favor of reprocessing spent nuclear fuel now make a compelling case, taking into account economic, environmental, safety, energy independence, technology development, and non-proliferation factors. And I would just leave you with one further thought with respect to dry cast storage. All of you work in Washington. If you step forward and say to your boss or to the public, I can solve a problem, a big problem, but I can only solve it for a hundred years. <laughs> I can solve poverty for a hundred years, but at the end of the, that hundred years, my solution goes away. My guess is that you'd get a medal, you wouldn't get raspberries. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, by the way, I failed to mention that there is a uh, op-ed out there, uh, which will be posted on National Review Online. I wrote it. Um, the conclusion, which might prompt more questions, at least at that op-ed, is, uh, I can read it, what then in, in the interim should Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo do? Uh, what every government excels at, delight. This means at a minimum deferring any decision to start Korean nuclear fuel making or to increase Japanese plutonium production as long as possible. Whatever time is gained should be used to figure out how to avoid unnecessary and uneconomic nuclear fuel making activities, not only by our enemies, that would be North Korea and Iran, as far as I guess I, I, that's politically incorrect to say they're enemies, but anyway, I've taken the license but by our allies as well. With that, I want to open it up for questions. Uh, how does this work? Do we have microphones? No. no. <coughs> well, you'll have to stand up just to identify uh, your affiliation and ask a question if you can. I, we really appreciate questions. Yes? Uh, Ross Smets, Bridger, National Nuclear Security Administration. Um, I certainly understand the concerns about reprocessing um, when I look a little bit more narrowly, maybe at the title of today's talk about whether the U.S. should encourage South Korea and Japan to make plutonium-based fuels, one of the things that I think of is that Japan already has 45 metric tons of separated plutonium, uh, 10 in Japan and the rest in the U.K. and France. And so I'm wondering, what do you think about the idea of encouraging Japan to use this plutonium that they already have uh, as 
a plutonium uh, mixed oxide fuel for use in their uh, light water reactors. Yes. Um, I think Japan I, I don't know, has, has about, uh, I guess, nine tons in country and about 35 tons in, uh, in France and the UK where it's, where it's sending spent fuel for reprocessing. Uh, it, it has tried, been trying to, uh, the Japanese utilities have been trying to, in fact, uh, uh, recycle uh, the, the plutonium from uh, France, which has an operating uh, so-called mixed oxide fuel uh, fabrication facility, which, which basically mixes the plutonium with uranium and makes a fuel equivalent to low enriched uranium. Uh, it, however, because of public resistance in, in Japan, uh, over the last 12 years, it's only succeeded in, in loading two and a half tons of, of, plutonium, of that 45 or so tons of plutonium into reactor. There's, there's, um, th there's a, a lot of uh, public concern of the, that, the, that this fuel would make it make the uh, reactors more dangerous. Uh, there's some basis for that, I mean, in the sense that the, um, the value, of the, the effectiveness of the control rods is somewhat reduced by, by uh, mock fuel. Um, and uh, so, so it, it looked like this program was about to start to roll, uh, and then the Fukushima accident happened. Uh, and there was, in fact, one of the few reactors that had this mixed oxide mock fuel, and it was in Fukushima number three, I think. Uh, and there was a lot of attention paid to that. I don't, it didn't, in fact, uh, significantly contribute to the severity of the accident, but it did get, it did then re refresh the bad name of the concern about mock fuel. And, and of course, the Japanese utilities are now trying to get permission to restart their reactors. Uh, to avoid trouble on this issue, that they're, they're not planning on using MOX fuel in the, in the near term. Uh, they're deferring that. You know, to, they're trying to try to get over the hump of public acceptance of just operating the reactors at all before adding the additional hump of, of uh, using MOX fuel. So it, it's for Japan at this point to to start a, a, a reprocessing plant that would separate eight ton, tons more a year when it hasn't been able to. To do, uh, whittle down, you know, more than five percent of the of the plutonium mountain that's already created seems irresponsible. Uh, you know, but but in fact, if they didn't operate the reprocessing plant, they would still have to get rid of that forty-four tons. And and um, MOX is one option, but if it doesn't work, there are other options. And and, uh, and I think that they should be explored. By the way, twenty years ago actually more than 20 years ago, there was a CEO of TEPCO who came into my small office at the Pentagon and was worried about whether he would give permission to let the French ship plutonium. I said, don't worry, it's well above my pay grade, it's been decided. I said, but I'm curious, he had like nine aides, which made the room very tight. <laughs> the office was very small. Well, what do you intend to do with this? And he said, they paused, he looked at one another, and he said, Manju, which is their breeding, it's not really working very well. You might want to comment on that. And by the way, reprocessing and pyro reprocessing are geared primarily for breeders, not mocks. That's right. You know, uh, Japan uh, built a demonstration breeder reactor. Uh, it it uh, came online. In, um, in 1995. These reactors differ from, from uh, the, the kind of reactors that we have around the world in that they're not cooled by water, they're cooled by liquid sodium. So if in fact, this, and sodium, if it comes into contact with the air or water, catches fire. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very tr troublesome technology. And in fact, after three months of operation, uh, there was a sodium fire. In, um, in, in, the, in the reactor and it shut down uh, until 2010 when they tried to restart it. 
and then they have a very, in order to, to keep the fuel, I mean, with a, with a water-cooled reactor, you can just take the top off, and you can fish the fuel out and, um, and, and uh, replace it. But in a uh, silicon-cooled reactor, you have very elaborate machines to, uh, uh, and, and compartments and so on, and, and a, a whole refueling machine to put down through a, uh, you know, airlock and so on, and, and they drop the refueling machine into the reactor. And so uh, in 2010, and so it's 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 still over since 1995. It's operated a total of three months, and uh, obviously hasn't required much fuel. I understand it's, it's operated for three months, but it's only supplied power to the grid for about an hour. I see. <laughs> um, but to get back to that question, I Frank and I start at this problem from different directions. We reach, I think, the same place on whether there ought to be reprocessing, but there may be some differences on some of the aspects. If, if Japan is able to whittle down that mountain of fuel by uh, using MOX fuel, uh, I think that's fine. I, I would not like to see any more plutonium separated, and I would like to see stocks of separated plutonium reduced. Yes. Hi, uh, Ted Jones with Nuclear Research Institute. Uh, thank you both for the presentations. They were very informative. Um, I have a two-part question. The first is, I've, I've heard in South Korean press and from South Korean representatives another justification in addition to the five you enumerated of, of national sovereign right. I'm take a note. <laughs> um, sovereign right to enter enrichment through processing as, as peaceful nuclear activities. And um, they say that this is a sovereign right, it's protected by Article 4 of the NPT, and many other countries would make the same, same claim. So my first question is, uh, what are the levers that the United States has to persuade um, South Korea to uh, forgo that, that right within a, the parameters of a Section 123 agreement? And specifically, to what extent do you think that U.S. consent obligations over Korean use fuel, uh, which is the legacy of U.S. supply of Korea's of 19 of Korea's 23 reactors, contributes to that leverage. Thanks. So that I think that's a good question. Um, I didn't you I didn't address sovereign right because I was addressing the question as to whether or not this was a sensible policy. Should they go forward with it. Do they have the right to? Absolutely. There's no question about that. But I would note that countries choose all the time not to do things they have a right to do. Um, every country in the world has a right to a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Not many do. Every country in the world has a, power, has a right to nuclear power reactors. Only 31 do. Um, so the question is, is it, is it sensible? No one's trying to take away rights here. But acknowledging that right should it go forward. Now, uh, in terms of leverage, um, the U.S. and South Korean nuclear industries are intertwined. And in fact, I think one of the reasons why this is such a, an important topic is that the 123 really does need to be renewed for nuclear commerce in both states <coughs> to continue successfully. Um, and in third states. And in third states, and with third states exactly, that, that both countries might wish to market to. And so um, I think there is strong leverage. We have to be mindful about, I mean, South Korea is a friend and an ally. Um, this isn't a question of resolving something using power. It's a question of resolving something using persuasion and trying to figure out what the, the best interests of both sides how they could be accommodated. And I, and I hope and believe that they can be. Uh, by the way, let me, let me take the, the red meat because <laughs> it's, it's everyone else's job to be reasonable on the <laughs> um, I think you should never take away rights that exist. You shouldn't grant them if they don't. And I think one of the things, independent of any work by my center, people like Ray Tacky have concluded, written in the Washington Post, is you don't concede rights to countries like Iran that may not be that clear. I see Chris Ford here, I see Bobby Zorante. 
there are people who are academics and legal scholars who actually don't think it's clear that the NPT gives that right. You'll notice the word doesn't appear in processing or enrichment or even fuel making. And in fact, there were suggestions to put it in and they were voted down. So it's a little more complicated. It does not help that our State Department is in violent agreement with North Korea and Iran on this. One of the suggestions might be something else that the United States government has an unlimited capacity to do if it wants to. And that is, take a pass. Stop hyping this. I don't think it helps. It surely is not going to help in our negotiations with Iran, much less if we ever have negotiations with North Korea. And it clearly is not going to help in trying to see clarity about the situation as to whether we're talking about an atomic airplane or something that's really a money maker. So I have to say that because that's actually what MPEG believes. But we're big-minded and we allow other views. <laughs> okay, next question. Hi, Tim Miklos, uh, Institute of Science and International Security. Um, it's, as for reprocessing, uh, it's a well-known fact that employing reprocessing technologies and fast breed reactors, you can reduce the radioactive lifespan of of spent fuel from 300,000 to 300 years, an incredibly significant amount. And that, that, that to me is probably the most convincing argument in favor of reprocessing. And I'd like to know how, how strong an argument do you think that is, and how, how important is that for the environment and for the future as a whole? Yeah, that's you. Um, <laughs> uh, we have had a debate over reprocessing in this country too, and, and that's been one of the arguments. And uh, it was uh, in in uh, the first the, the first Bush administration, the Bush senior administration, uh, asked the Department of Energy asked uh, the National Academy of Sciences to do a study on the costs and benefits of what what uh, they call separations and transmutation. That is basically, uh, in the case of the plutonium and the other long-lived transuranic elements, fissioning them to uh, shorter, shorter life fission part, mostly shorter life fission part. The the uh, academy concluded that it would be very costly, which which I, uh, I think is is obvious uh, given the experience we've had, uh, and the the benefit would be pretty minor, which would be. Uh, the radiation doses involved um, in the short term, you, you know, the occupational doses would go up because you're you're separating out and processing the radioactive material, and you're in exchange you're hoping to reduce the uh, doses a hundred thousand years from now from uh, material leaking out of a some material leaking perhaps leaking out of a repository which is uh, half a mile. Uh, it, they, they, they didn't think, in fact, that it was clear that there was a benefit, you know, doing that, and, and, and they did emphasize the cost. And they also mentioned it's also a proliferation issue. And, and in the, uh, the U.S., you know, what, part, what stabilized the U.S. in our non-reprocessing position has been the argument that uh, if we you know, that, that we then have, can have a policy, we don't do it, you don't need to do it either. And that's been much more effective than if we had done it like France and said, well, you shouldn't do it, which in fact was a policy that, that was tried out for a while in the, uh, in the uh, Bush II administration. They, they put forward a proposal that the weapon states in Japan will reprocess, other countries will not, uh, and uh, that didn't go over at all. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't rule out forever the possibility that we could um, find the technology to take advantage of the phenomenon you cite. The first sustained fission reaction was December, started December 2nd, 1942. Um, we've obviously come a long way from the Chicago pile. I wouldn't rule out the notion that 100 years from now, um, our successors will be able to do better than we can. 
But I would ar also argue that dry cask storage um, preserves that option. So the far, far side. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Timothy Westmeyer. I'm at the Rising Power Initiative at George Washington University. I was wondering uh, if you thought that the current events going on in North Korea well, are shaping this debate one way or the other in terms <coughs> of uh, the need for reprocessing with the potential of having that as, uh, as, as a fallback for security purposes. Is that, is that just an excuse? Is that actually shaping? Uh, this certainly seems to appear to be the way in terms of the media's uh, representation of this event. Thank you. Um, the, the, this issue, Kerry, the Korean Atomic Energy Research Institute, has been pushing reprocessing, as I said, for, for a long time. But this only became a major political issue in South Korea uh, in 2009 after the North Korean second test. The, the, I, the, I believe that's the, last, that's the first time that the word nuclear sovereignty uh, was, 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 uh, became a public uh, mantra you know, of, of advocates of, of re and, and was picked up by, the, uh, uh, by politicians. Uh, it became more than a technical discussion between the, between the, you know, the nuclear communities of the U.S. And, and South Korea. I guess I'd just say I, I would hope not. We shouldn't be allowing uh, a somewhat irrational regime in Pyongyang to be driving important policy decisions. I would also argue that the extended deterrence and the U.S. ROK alliance are more than capable of dealing with this issue. Well, let me just add that as a sign of your reasonableness, uh, it's pretty clear it is thriving and unfortunately. Uh, we heard a presentation yesterday by uh, a fellow who just left the committee as staff. I think he's been on there for 18 years. Gabby held it. Is Florence here? Thank you. It was a very interesting meeting. Thank you. And what he said was quite sensible. He said, you know, I don't know much about atomic energy, but my guess is if there are headlines saying, we're going to bomb you, we're going to strike Guam, we'd like to start a war if you continue to have exercises to defend yourself. Someone coming forward and saying, well, we'd like to make some interesting modifications to nuclear cooperation with South Korea so that they can make nuclear fuel, uh, you know, might not be choosing the right time to talk about it. Moreover, if you take a look at the press in these two countries over the last six months, there have been a number of prominent former officials, parliamentarians, in both countries saying, well, we've got to have this civil, peaceful option to make bombs. It's in the air. And I don't know that the American press has plumbed all of that. But despite that, they're not wrong yet. It's a problem. Oh, but one other thing. I came to this topic uh, 22 years ago when Korea was pushing to get pyro, and the Defense Department said no. It wasn't state, it was defense. Yes. Edward Roeder, Sunshine Press. I have a question, or a quick follow-up to that last one. Has anyone even considered the notion of trying to get South Korea to make giving up its reprocessing a SOP to North Korea? Just a trade away? That's just, anyway, we'll get, get to my question if I can, sure. which is more basic. Could you discuss the cost, capacity, and resilience of the casks? Uh, if you were to put 100 tons on the ellipse and someone were to fly a 727 into it, what would happen? What would happen if they were under the World Trade Center when it collapsed? What would happen if they were in an earthquake? And, and what's the cost of making them super resilient so virtually nothing can happen to them? That's yours. <laughs> By the way, we exclude asteroids. 
the, the uh, just first on the on the agreement. Uh, in fact, in 1992, uh, there was a, 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 a Korean Peninsula denuclearization agreement between South and North Korea, where whereby both countries agreed that they would not reprocess and they would not enrich. Of course, North Korea has has uh, violated that agreement in space. Um, uh, but, and and uh, as many people in South Korea consider it a dead letter. Uh, but as the U.S. has been arguing that if in fact uh, South Korea reprocesses it, riches, it will, you know, to the extent we still have some hope that we might be able to corral the North, uh, it would make it much more difficult, you know, for the, to get, but it, I think it, that's becoming a pretty dim hope. Um, on the on the resilient, I can't remember all the things you were insulting the casks with. Uh, one, one was a seven twenty seven capacity and resilience. No, no, but you you, you had seven twenty seven crashing into it an earthquake, and I can't remember what the third World Trade Center. World Trade Center. World Trade Center. World Trade Center. Fall. World Trade Center fall. <laughs> well, these are these are in fact pretty uh, robust uh, things. See. The, uh, I, I know that there, there was a test uh, with an anti tank weapon against a, um, uh, a cask. Uh, and you can make a hole with an anti tank weapon. And you could possibly make, if the, uh, not the 727, you know, if the, 720, the spindle of a 727 engine hit it right on at, at high speed, you could potentially penetrate a cask with a spindle. But, but there's, um, it's, it's very, you'd have a hole in the cask and you might have a little radioactivity. You, I mean, you, you did, that's when you, when, when uh, this test was done at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, with simulated fuel, it wasn't real spent fuel. There was some, uh, some particles of, of uh, uranium um, were sprinkled around in the neighborhood. Uh, but it was not, was not a, would not have been a major event. Um, uh, an earthquake, uh, you know, if those standing up cast could potentially, if a violent enough earthquake could tip them over, uh, maybe that's why the Japanese store them, you know, on their sides. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't in fact. Uh, they're, they're designed to be dropped off bridges onto, onto spikes, you know. I mean, they're, 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 they're pretty well, for the transportation cast, they're, they're really pretty, pretty robust. and. and uh, uh, there, you know, there's nothing, so compared with pools, and few kind of fear that one has of, of uh, the water being lost from a pool and fire and the fuel catching on fire, it's, it's not comparable. It's much safer. It's not absolutely safe, but it's much safer. Jack, I think you had a question. I did. Yeah. Um, Jack starts from the Heritage Foundation. One of the things that makes me sort of uncomfortable with this debate, certainly how you laid it out was that we talk about you know, South Korea is our friend, they're our good ally, and we have all these great relations. Um, we trust you, but we either think you're too stupid to make an economically sound and rational decision with your nuclear energy policy, or we think you're going to make a bomb. <clears throat> and to me, given, you know, the, the, they're, they're, the, given the reality of our relationship, where they are in society and in their advanced industri industrialized country, doesn't seem like a sound place on which to build future relations with them. And I'm just wondering, you know, is that essentially what you're saying, one, one or the other? <coughs> sure. Um, well, as I said at the outset, I consider myself a friend of South Korea and I support the alliance. So, and the, my comments are, are meant to be um, a part of a of a debate over a public policy that's going on within South Korea. It's not only Americans who have this view or that all South Koreans are of a particular view. There are some in South Korea who would like to pursue the reprocessing option, but certainly not all. Um, second, I would say that I would characterize my position as favoring a principled stand against the spread, the further spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology. Wherever, whatever country. But, but, but you go through your five reasons, all sort of directed at South Korea, why 
they shouldn't be doing this. It's not about, I mean, you, you talk no, about the other things. This issue but is, the essence of your argument is the five. Well, well this issue has come to four because of the, the 123 agreement with, with South Korea. Um, and the desire on, on the part of some to get prior consent to reprocessing. I could go through all of those same arguments with any other country, and I think, frankly, that Japan has made a mistake. Um, and I think, actually, I mean, looking back on the record, I would think that any Japanese utility executive would think about that. Um, so, you know, I, I offer these suggestions as someone who's studied a bit of the history, a bit of the technology, and if I can help contribute to a successful public policy decision, in either the ROK or Japan, I would hope to do so. If I were a rate payer in, or a taxpayer in either Japan or South Korea, I would be saying the same things that I've said here. Right. If I could just add, I mean, during during the uh, the second Bush Bush administration, I probably gave a hundred staff briefings up here against reprocessing in the U.S. And there was there was a serious push in the Bush administration and also by Arriva to sell the U.S. a, a reprocessing plan. Same arguments that we've been making against, uh, and, and two weeks ago I was in Paris, making the arguments that the French should get out of this, out of this business. So I'm a <laughs> undiscriminating anti-reprocessing ar argument. <laughs> For what it's worth, uh, that point is each argument seems specific, but if you take a look at the arguments both for and against this, they stay the same in every case. So I think that's a little unfair. Also, this is not a panel on how we should improve uh, our alliance with South Korea, but if you did, boy, I'd have a list, and this would not be on it. It wouldn't be anywhere close to the top. But, but we're not